pleased, pleased to welcome Dr. Tan today. Uh, Dr. Zali Tan is the director of Cedar Sinai Health System uh, Memory and Aging Program, and his primary oversight is the optimization of care for persons living with dementia throughout the largest nonprofit academic health system in the Western United States. So it's a great big responsibility. Um, as the medical director for the Jonah Goldrich Center for Alzheimer's and Memory Disorders, he leads the clinical and research activities in Alzheimer's disease and related dementias at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Dr. Tan holds the Carmen and Lewis Walshock Endowed Chair in Neurology, and he's a professor of neurology and medicine at Cedar sinai and the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He performs health services and quality improvement research at Cedar sinai and epidemiological research at the Framingham Heart Study. Uh, Dr. Tan's studies on brain aging and memory have been published in major medical journal journals and featured in the New York Times, Time Magazine, CNN, The Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and other national publications. I've had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Tan for several years, way back to our, our fellowship time together in geriatrics, so it's truly a pleasure for me to welcome Zaldi here, even virtually, um, and uh, he will be speaking, us, speaking to us today on the dementia-capable health system, present challenges, and future opportunities. Uh, Dr. Tan, welcome to Penn. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here as a visiting scholar at Penn, and um, it's a true honor to, to be able to speak to you about uh, some of my passions and my current and future work in uh, improving the system of care for our patients with memory impairment. I will uh, take time to share my screen now. Um, there you go. And if you could just confirm that you can see the screen. Yes, we can. Okay, I will put it on the slideshow format now. Is this okay? Yes, that's good. Perfect, thank you, Lisa. All right, so again, thank you, and I'm looking forward to uh, speaking to you about this, and hopefully we'll have uh, some good discussion about, um, about this topic. All right, so this is the outline of uh, what I'm going to be talking to you today. Um, we'll first talk about dementia in general, uh, what, it is, what, what, um, what the prevalence is like, and what the patterns that we're seeing. Uh, and then we will talk about what the dementia-capable health system is, why it's important, uh, and what are some of the characteristics. And then uh, we'll be diving into some of the challenges and future opportunities to improve the health care that we provide for our people uh, with uh, living with dementia. So this slide just shows us the global, um, uh, glo global burden of neurologic diseases. Um, and what you can see here is that certainly in the younger age group, in children, uh, infectious diseases like meningitis, encephalitis, uh, which affects the brain, uh, has a high incidence and a high disease burden. But since we're in the Institute on Aging, we're, con we're interested in uh, people who are older. If you look at um, uh, uh, the part, uh, the people over 65, uh, 65, 70, 75, you can see the, the burden and the incidence is much higher for uh, two specific neurologic diseases, and these are stroke and Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Now, looking at it, again, this is global data, not, not just United States. Uh, looking at it from the left side, looking at the uh, disability-adjusted life years. This is basically the disease burden uh, from getting these neurologic diseases. And on the right side is death. Um, so for, um, for the disability-adjusted life years, as you can see here, uh, for all age groups, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, meningitis, migraine are among the highest um, burdens, most burdensome neurologic diseases. But in terms of death, a neurologic disease that results in uh, loss of life, it's really Alzheimer's disease and stroke. So if you think about neurologic diseases uh, or diseases that affect the brain, um, Alzheimer's disease and stroke are, are two of the biggest players. Um, now looking at the United States, that, as I mentioned, those were global data that I showed you looking at the United States. Again, Alzheimer's disease and stroke are the two of the most common 
uh, diseases that affect the brain. We certainly hear about other neurologic diseases that are a lot, a lot less common, like ALS, uh, MS, uh, you know, brain cancer, Parkinson's disease, uh, traumatic brain injury, epilepsy. So those are certainly very devastating and, and very important neurologic diseases. But compared to Alzheimer's disease and stroke, they are uh, far less common. And going more specifically at high income North America, which is where we live in the United States, you can see that uh, Alzheimer's disease or dementia is number one in terms of disability adjusted life years. So this just emphasizes how important um, Alzheimer's disease is in um, reducing the, the number of years we have that are of high quality and high functioning. Uh, stroke is number two in this. So certainly uh, Alzheimer's disease is right up there in terms, uh, in terms of importance and a number of people that are affected and uh, the, the, the significance uh, of its effect in our population. This is a slide that, uh, that we, sh we show for to illustrate the number of people who are turning 65 and older um, with um, improving public health, improving uh, uh, management of chronic conditions. We see that more and more people are living uh, over the age of 65, and certainly the fastest uh, go uh, growing age group is in fact uh, the 85 plus. And in fact, the 85 plus are the ones who are most prone to developing dementia. In some series, up to 50% of people over the age of 85 actually have dementia, whether diagnosed or undiagnosed. So it's again, very common age-related uh, disease. It is not just in the United States. This um, illustration shows you that, uh, in fact, uh, most of the dementias are in uh, the in Asia, Europe, uh, Africa. They all are uh, burdened by uh, Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. And certainly in the Americas and the United States, we have a, a very high incidence as well. So it is a global phenomenon. So we've done a great job in terms of uh, managing chronic diseases like brain, breast cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease, stroke, certainly infectious diseases like HIV. Uh, these medical advances really have allowed us to uh, um, improve uh, on treatments and reduce uh, each of these diseases as the cause of death or mortality associated with these uh, diseases. Uh, but in Alzheimer's disease, not so much. Right in the period from year 2000 to 2013, uh, we've actually seen a greater, a much 71% uh, increase in Alzheimer's disease as a cause of death in the United States. Now, of course, some of this may be because of increased recognition of Alzheimer's disease as uh, a life-limiting condition, but uh, there's also the fact that our population is getting older and living to the age of risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. So what does Alzheimer's disease and related dementias look like currently? Currently about 5 million, uh, some serious, it's up to 6 million Americans are living with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Most of them are over the age of 65, as I mentioned, it's an age-related condition, but about 200,000 people are below the age of 65. So there are people in their 40s, 50s who get dementia, especially certain types of dementia like frontotemporal dementia tend to affect younger age group. Now, if you look at um, the, the, the proportion of our population over the age of 65, about 10 to 11% have dementia. When you get to 85, as I mentioned, 32 to 50% of people over the age of 85 uh, have dementia. And certainly the older we get, the greater the risk of developing dementia. In fact, some series say that a third of all seniors who die actually have dementia pathology, whether it's diagnosed or not. So it is very common. Besides being common, it's also a very expensive disease. Um, um, according to the Alzheimer's Association, it costs uh, $305 billion in cost uh, in the year 2020. And um, in fact, if one were to look at the cost of Alzheimer's disease in the last five years of life, it is much more expensive compared to someone, for example, suffering from heart disease or cancer. So again, the last five years of life, Alzheimer's disease is much more expensive than even uh, cancer or heart disease. So again, a very high um, 
burden. So the challenge currently for us with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias is that this sort of continuum of decline uh, of our memory, our, our cognition, and our function as years go by, uh, we have really no effective way of uh, decreasing this uh, or changing this trajectory. So we, we go from preclinical to MCI to dementia, and uh, we our function and our memory declines as the years go by. And currently, we don't have any disease-modifying agents that can uh, change the, the trajectory of this curve. Another way to look at Alzheimer's disease and dementia is looking at the pathology. So what happens in the brain itself um, uh, when someone is uh, on the road to developing Alzheimer's disease? Well, what happens is that uh, these abnormal proteins called amyloid and tau start developing. Um, a lot of people in, in this uh, area feel that this actually develops years uh, before uh, the actual uh, disease manifests itself. So if you look at this uh, illustration, you can see that amyloid and tau, the abnormal proteins that are thought to develop to cause Alzheimer's disease, can develop 10, sometimes some, some people say 20 years before the first sign of the memory, memory problem. Um, and, and this is something that we need to think about because, um, because uh, this gives us the opportunity to intervene early, potentially, even before the first signs of memory problems happen. Uh, and, and currently, at least, my patients uh, come to me already when the memory problems have started. And in fact, a lot of patients come when, uh, when, the, when the memory problems have uh, gone uh, for several years. So another thing to think about is, um, is biomarkers. So if I go back here to this slide, you can see that amyloid tau uh, brain atrophy occurs even before the first sign of a memory problem. So this gives us the opportunity to detect disease as early as possible. So for example, for a structural MRI or a CAT scan, you can get the MRI CAT scan and you can see changes in the brain, specific areas of the brain, even before memory problems start. Uh, an FDG PET uh, looks at the metabolism of the brain and looks at decreased metabolism in certain parts of the brain uh, that is affected by Alzheimer's disease. Uh, one can get an amyloid PET scan, which is um, a marker that uh, binds to the abnormal protein in the brain, and you can see it uh, through, the, through the MRI or CAT scan. Uh, or you can get a spinal tap and get um, a sample of the cerebrospinal fluid and measure the tau and A beta in, these, um, in this um, uh, fluid to see if one is developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, Coming soon, uh, in the next few years, we predict there will be blood tests. So basically, you can go to your uh, geriatrician, neurologist, uh, psychiatrist. They will get a blood test and will tell you whether your amyloid uh, or your phosphatau or your neurofilament light is elevated and can predict to a reasonable degree of certainty whether you are on the road to developing dementia. So that's in the future. And then we also have tau PET scan. So again, we are getting um, advances in our, our knowledge, in our technology, in our diagnostics for dementia, but the challenge is that we don't have a cure, right? Uh, we have something called the ATN classification, which looks at the pathology itself of dementia, amyloid, tau, neurodegeneration, which we feel, those of us in the field, feel that this would revolutionize the way we think of Alzheimer's disease as a monolithic disease. In fact, it is not. Uh, different uh, types of dementia have different burdens of amyloid tau and neurodegeneration. So transitioning to treatment, um, this is the uh, trajectory, this blue line you see here is a trajectory of the cognitive decline that happens if Alzheimer's disease is left untreated. Now, the symptomatic treatments that we have, which are FDA approved, does this, right? It improves the cognition, but it doesn't change the slope of the decline in cognitive function. What we're hoping to accomplish through disease modification is uh, this trajectory, which is um, uh, uh, decreasing the slope of the decline so that people can have longer years of uh, independent function for as long as possible. So that's where we are uh, in the current state of things. The challenge I can tell you from um, 
from someone who does clinical trials and research in Alzheimer's disease is that the failure rate of uh, medications for Alzheimer's disease is very high, 99.6% failure rate. Um, if you look at this, uh, uh, this illustration from Dr. Jeff Cummings, you can see that while we don't have uh, a cure uh, for Alzheimer's disease, it's not because of lack of trying. Uh, these are all uh, molecules, uh, biologics, uh, small molecules uh, that are being currently um, uh, tested to see if it will change the course of, of Alzheimer's disease. They are in different phases of clinical trial, phase one, phase two, phase three. In fact, one of them called aducanumab is, is currently being uh, reviewed by the FDA for potential approval as a, the first disease modifying therapy for Alzheimer's disease. So I think uh, disease modifying therapies are on the way for Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, but we're not there yet. And if you um, reflect on what I said, that the, the failure rate of these kinds of therapy is as high as 99.6%, it's likely that we won't get any um, disease modifying therapies in the next few years. So in summary, for the care versus cure uh, dilemma for dementia, Effective therapies are on the way, but are likely going to be years away. Um, there are disease modifying agents that are seeking FDA approval, but we're not there yet. And even if we do get FDA approval, the question is how efficacious will they be? How safe they will be? And what will they cost? Will Medicare uh, cover it uh, or not? For example, uh, amyloid, the amyloid scan, the amyloid PET scan, Medicare still doesn't cover it. It's still self-pay. So just because it's FDA approved does not mean that it will be paid for by our insurance system. So it's something to think about. Um, uh, prevention and therapeutic advances um, are likely going to decrease the disease burden in our population. But uh, the fact that dementia starts one to two decades before the symptom onset will make this uh, challenging and will probably not uh, prevent, just like heart disease and cancer, uh, we, we could reduce the incidence, but we're likely not going to eliminate uh, heart disease or cancer or dementia from our, uh, from our population um, uh, just by prevention and, and therapy. So um, it's safe to say that uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia are unfortunately go here to stay in our population, especially as we live longer towards the age of risk. So this leads me to the transition, right? This talk is about the measure capable health system. So we are certainly trying to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, but I feel even more importantly and more immediate is the need to find innovative ways to treat and to manage dementia in our population. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement or the IHI um, um, put out this, uh, this um, call or challenge to our health system called the triple aim of improving patient experience or providing better care on top of this pyramid, um, improving the health of population or, or, or achieving better health, and then finally reducing per capita costs of healthcare or achieving better value in healthcare. So these are what we call the IHI triple aim. It's sort of the holy grail of health services research and quality improvement. Um, and if we look at this uh, as a sort of uh, guide as to where we are in dementia care, it'll be good to see where we are uh, in terms of the current state uh, of dementia care that we develop, we, we provide to Americans. So starting top of this pyramid, better patient, better care, does the patient Caregiver have a good experience in terms of dementia care. Uh, looking at this more closely, um, this is um, uh, from our data from uh, the study we did at UCLA for the dementia care program. Caregivers and patients at baseline uh, don't have uh, are not in a good place. 14% uh, of um, caregivers are moderate to severe depressive symptoms, and 36% of them um, experience high stress. Uh, they also have low self-efficacy. Uh, they are uh, only 36%, for example, are confident in handling dementia-related problems in their loved ones. Uh, and only 26% have a health professional who helps through dementia issues. Mind you, it doesn't mean that they don't have primary care. They have primary care physicians, they have neurologists, they may have geriatricians, but 
only a quarter of them know who to turn to whenever they get dementia-related issues. That speaks to the fact that our health system currently do not provide our patients and caregiver the, the, the best experience, right? So it's a no for the top of that pyramid. Our patient experience, caregiver experience, uh, is not great for dementia. How about uh, population health? So um, this study was done by Neil Wenger and, and his colleagues uh, looking at the ACO, the, uh, the quality indicators for older patients, and this is specifically for dementia. So for people who, who screen positive for cognitive impairment, uh, let's say in primary care, only a quarter of them uh, uh, have a subsequent cognitive evaluation if they screen positive. Only 9% had their medications checked, 29% had caregiver support, and less than half had behavioral psychological support. So again, quality indicators for dementia are not routinely met in primary care. There's also poor linkages in community-based resources. So again, in terms of population health, we as a health system in the United States are not doing a great job in terms of uh, uh, improving the care for dementia. How about the last one? Uh, per capita cost or better value? Are we providing good value for patients with dementia? Um, not so much, right? So if you think, look at the cost of care for dementia, uh, compared to seniors without dementia, from Medicare on the left, Medicaid on the right, you can see that the amount of uh, the, 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 what we spend for patients with dementia, seniors with dementia, for both Medicare and Medicaid are quite high, right? And the previous slides I showed you that the, the quality of care and patient uh, satisfaction is not super high either. What are we getting for this uh, money that we're spending for uh, patients with dementia? Well, I can tell you it's not that much, right? We're, because we're not providing the care that, that they need. In fact, um, in terms of um, uh, uh, emphasizing how much we're spending for dementia, if dementia was, um, was, a, was a company or was an economy, it would be the 18th largest in the world, and it would be larger uh, uh, in term, more than Apple or Google. Um, because of the amount of spending that we spend in dementia is pretty dramatic um, worldwide. So unfortunately, uh, in terms of the IHI triple aim of better care, better health, and better value, um, I, argue, I would argue that we are not providing uh, as good a care as we can. Uh, so where does that lead us? So this is the main um, um, purpose of giving a talk like this, is talking about dementia-capable health systems. So what is a dementia-capable health system and what is dementia-capable to begin with? Dementia-capable is an interesting term because it was cited back in, the 19, in 1990 uh, by the U.S. Office of Technology Assessment in a report that they had uh, on dementia. But it really didn't um, caught on that much in the 90s. In 2013, uh, as part of the U.S. National Plan to Address Alzheimer's Disease, it was uh, used as a term to describe much capable, capable workforce, much capable programs, services, or systems, but it wasn't really used to describe a health system. In the 2013 uh, National Alzheimer's Plan, if you look at the, the five main goals or thrusts of the NAPA, uh, you can see that three of them uh, um, are related to uh, dementia capability, enhancing the care, quality and efficiency of patients with dementia, supporting people with uh, Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, and improving data uh, uh, collection to track progress. Those are all related to dementia capability, but they weren't, uh, they didn't specifically use the term uh, dementia capable. Some people are using dementia capable and dementia friendly uh, interchangeably, but one can argue that those are quite different. Dementia friendly focuses on uh, more of the experience of the individual or the caregiver with dementia and not necessarily the health system. So this brings us to the main topic that we're gonna be talking to us to you today, which is dementia-capable health system. So what is dementia-capable health system? So Sue Borson and Josh Chodosh actually gave, uh, wrote this uh, very interesting article uh, in 2014 about the dementia-capable health system and they, they ventured uh, a definition. Uh, and then Lynn and Lewis in the same year also um, um, tackle this, uh, this issue. So um, I highlighted here in red sort of the keywords of what the dementia-capable health system is. 
So in, in that, essentially, there's a lot of overlap between these two, um, two uh, papers. Um, malicious capable health systems tend to be individualized. They tend to be coordinated or integrated. Um, they have to deal with not just the medical, but also the psychosocial care of patients with dementia. And it's not just patients, but also their care partners or caregivers. They have to be uh, delivered in teams, not individually, but in teams. And there has to be structure and system resources that are made available to families. So I, I think based on these two uh, definitions, you can get a, um, an idea of what uh, a dementia-capable health system looks like, right? Uh, and I can argue that most health systems are not dementia-capable at this point. Um, and why is that? Why are our health systems not dementia-capable? I, I venture four reasons why that is. First is low dementia literacy, which I will expound on. Second is the lack of system to identify patients with dementia early. Uh, third is the fragmentation of um, patient care paths and lack of care coordination in, uh, in our uh, uh, outpatient clinics. And fourth is misalignment of the incentives for physicians, hospitals, and health systems. So let's tackle the first one, which is low dementia literacy. When I say literacy, uh, I meant health literacy. Uh, health literacy is defined by Nielsen and Bowman as the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand the basic health information and services needed to make appropriate health decisions, right? So health literacy can be applied to health literacy about heart disease or about dementia or about diabetes. But specific to dementia literacy, um, I would say that dementia literacy would be the ability of individuals to recognize the signs of symptoms of dementia uh, relative to normal cognitive aging. Also, uh, having a basic knowledge of what the diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease or related dementias are like. And finally, familiarity with community-based services and resources for persons living with dementia. So I think um, we, we, most of us will agree that in terms of dementia literacy, overall, our health population, so the people that uh, we care for, as well as uh, uh, the people that are, uh, are taking care of us, our nurses, our, our, our uh, physicians, may not be the most dementia literate right, in terms of being able to recognize signs and symptoms of dementia versus normal aging, knowing the basic diagnosis and treatment and knowing what community-based services are available. So certainly we can do a better job in educating our uh, general public, our patients, on what normal aging is relative to the early signs of dementia, so they come to us early. But I think part of the problem is that even our health systems, our healthcare workers, are not as knowledgeable about dementia. So why is that? Specifically primary care. Looking at a typical primary care physician panel of about 1,300 to 2,000 patients, so that's a typical number of patients that a primary care physicians are treating. About 13% of these are in the geriatric age group, uh, um, 65 years and, and older. Right. So, and then uh, of these, about 10% have Alzheimer's disease or related dementias. So, about 26 out of the 2,000 patients have dementia. And we know from data that only 50% of dementia in primary care are diagnosed. So, essentially, the primary care physician, the typical primary care physician in the United States, is aware only of 13 patients out of his or her 2,000 patients who have dementia. So even though dementia is not a rare disease, as I showed you, um, 6 million Americans have dementia. From the primary care, typical primary care physician standpoint, it's not that common to his or her practice. So in a sense, it makes, uh, it, it makes it more difficult for that primary care physician to be, uh, to be uh, capable of managing dementia and knowing uh, how to uh, detect dementia and manage it when it is detected. So um, I would say that the consequence of uh, our current structure in dementia care uh, in primary practice is that primary care physicians lack the necessary knowledge and comfort in managing uh, complex dementia. And I think that adds to the barriers 
of producing a dementia-capable health system. Secondly, another barrier for a dementia-capable health system is a lack of a system to early identify patients with uh, dementia. So, um, as you know, uh, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is, uh, is the one that guides health healthcare systems and health professionals on what to screen for and what to manage. And uh, in 2020, the USPSTF upheld its stance that uh, there is currently lack of uh, sufficient evidence to uh, support uh, the benefits or harms of screening for cognitive impairment in older adults. It doesn't say that, that uh, health professionals should not be screening for dementia. It just says that uh, the benefit and harms uh, is unclear uh, because um, uh, of the current system of uh, dementia care. But I think this contributes to the low rates of evaluation and diagnosis of dementia in the primary care space. So in fact, um, over 50% of patients with confirmed dementia uh, in this series uh, by Cottagall and Al reported that they had no history of receiving a cognitive evaluation by their physician. So it is um, quite, uh, st um, uh, quite uh, um, interesting to know that uh, even if you have dementia, most of the time, uh, or half of the time, you never had a content evaluation by your primary physician. And there's also system factors that um, makes it uh, uh, difficult to identify dementia in the primary care environment. So resources are limited, are, as I mentioned, uh, uh, um, in a typical primary care uh, clinic and the physicians don't see dementia that often, or at least don't recognize it that often. Uh, they're busy, they have limited time, typically, typically 15 to 20 minutes per patient visit. Uh, and in a lot of communities, there's a lack of specialists to refer these patients to when they're identified. Uh, there's also relatively low financial incentives for uh, identifying these patients. Uh, and uh, in public health, it's not prioritized. <coughs> Excuse me. So what results is a fragmented dementia care? Uh, this is from the Stanford uh, Clinical Center of Excellence uh, uh, for Research Excellence. And uh, what you can see here is that the U.S. spends billions of dollars per year on dementia care, and yet uh, there's a lot of waste. There's a lot of fragmentation in care because of the lack of coordination in dementia care paths and care coordination. So one, one thing that uh, we've attempted, attempted here at UCLA uh, is, um, is um, uh, what we call the dementia care program. So what we did was uh, we trained nurse practitioners to co-manage dementia in, uh, in dementia care, uh, managing the, the medical, behavioral, social, and caregiver issues related to dementia. And what we found was that um, it's actually quite beneficial from, uh, from a standpoint of reducing behavioral symptoms, uh, improving uh, depression, of patients with dementia, reducing caregiver distress, um, uh, having less caregiver depression, improving uh, nursing home placements, reduction uh, in nursing home placements, and lowering overall Medicare cost of care for patients with dementia. Revisiting the IHI triple aim, looking at uh, those three sides of the pyramid, the UCLA Dementia Care um, provides better care in the sense that it meets more of the quality indicators for dementia quality, uh, and uh, it provides higher caregiver satisfaction and physician satisfaction, and also saves physician time. It provides better health in the sense that it improves the confidence and self-efficacy of caregivers for dementia. It improves um, patient behavior and caregiver stress strain uh, depressive symptoms and distress. Looking at caregiver outcomes, this just shows you that uh, whether you look at uh, uh, dementia burden scale, the NPIQ, or the neuropsychiatric inventory, uh, modified caregiver strain index, or PHQ-9, they all showed an improvement in terms of uh, being part of the dementia program. Uh, it also provides better value. Um, this is a paper that we published looking at the cost or the, the value of dementia care. Uh, so it decreased overall long-term care facility admission, although it did not change hospitalization, emergency department visit, or 30-day 30, 30 readmission in this series. It actually increased referral to hospice, 
um, and reduces hosp reduced hospitalization ED visits in the last six months of life. So the overall, if you look at the cost of care, um, it saves $600 per patient per quarter. Uh, and um, and, and to, if you, um, if you um, take into account the cost of the program, the net uh, cost for dementia care is um, minus $284, so $284, even if you take into account the costs of uh, providing uh, uh, the dementia care program. UCLA is not uh, alone in this. Uh, Kate Pozine and uh, her, her colleagues at the UCSF has the care ecosystem, which is a telephone-based collaborative dementia care. Um, it's a lower cost model because a lot of it is provided by uh, telephone, by uh, uh, trained dementia care team navigators. And they also and they provide education support and care coordination, and they found improvements in quality of life, reduced ED visits, and um, decreased caregiver depression and burden. So again, um, uh, UCLA uh, dementia care program, UCSF care system, uh, Chris Callahan and the Las Bustani's uh, Aging Brain Center uh, also showed this. So certainly, there's no lack of data that um, uh, effective care management. Um, uh, achieves the IHI triple aim and also um, uh, provides good value. Fourth reason for why we don't have more dementia capable health system is misalignments of incentives uh, for physicians, hospital, and health system. So as you know, Medicare fee-for-service uh, and other fee-for-service um, arrangements actually rewards episodic, high complexity, low value, high cost care. So uh, the current billing uh, for physicians, for hospitals, um, reimburses more for when more is done, right? So more tests, more imaging, more medications, that re results in higher fees to, to the provider. So I argue that that is uh, misaligned for specifically for, for dementia care. It may make, make sense for certain other disease processes, but during for dementia where we have no disease modifying therapies and no cure, it's misaligned. Added to that is that the current uh, structure of our healthcare system in the United States provides very little incentive for physicians, hospitals, and health system to coordinate uh, dementia care and reduce low value care. Uh, and therefore, it's not surprising that current Medicare payment structure leads to care fragmentation from the home our, our community, hospital, to, uh, to uh, long-term care or subacute care. So I think these misalignments in our incentives is really one of the major drivers for why we don't have dementia-capable health systems. So I'd like to focus the, uh, um, the last half of my talk uh, specifically looking at hospital care for persons living with dementia, which is my current uh, area of interest in terms of uh, research and uh, um, care improvement. So what do we know about hospital care for patients with dementia? So we know that patients with dementia are more likely to end up in the hospital than people with similar age uh, who do not have dementia. This is done by Katie Maslow et al. looking, saying that patients with dementia are twice as likely to be admitted to the hospital. Than their non demented counterparts. Um, there is also a higher incidence of dementia. Uh, having uh, dementia is also associated with increased risk for hospitalization for ambulatory care sensitive conditions. So, what are ambulatory care sensitive conditions, you might ask? Well, these are conditions that are potentially preventable in the ambulatory care setting, such as dehydration, such as falls such as hyponatremia. Um, so these are patient, things that are potentially preventable in ambulatory care, but because of, um, of the challenges of our uh, health systems in providing dementia-capable ambulatory care, they end up in our hospitals, unfortunately. In fact, um, in, in the UK, they felt that 20% of hospital admissions for patients with dementia are potentially preventable with good, solid primary care. Um, and yet 40% uh, of patients with dementia over the age 70 are admitted to the hospital have dementia. So highly prevalent. So you go to any hospital in the United States, look around, and you'll see that the older patients who are admitted there, uh, 40 to 50% of them have dementia. 
So very, very uh, significant. So what do we know about hospital care for uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease? Well, the other thing we know about them is that it's costly and they are uh, high resource use. So it's um, interesting, uh, in fact, shocking, that 63% of Medicare costs for Alzheimer's disease are spent for inpatient hospital care. So if you look at the total Medicare costs for Alzheimer's disease, 63% of them are spent in the hospital. Now, um, it's also interesting to note that, uh, that the cost of care for dementia is not equally distributed. In fact, 10% of Medicare beneficiaries account for 50% of total health expenditures and a third of drug expenditures. So that means the high utilizers of, uh, of uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease who are high utilizers, 10% of them are responsible for 50% of health expenditures. So this is sobering that we need to identify patients who are um, in the most uh, uh, need for medical care and uh, find ways to, to curb that cost. Um, a lot of when I did this literature review, um, I found that a lot of data uh, on hospital care for patients with ADRD actually came from the UK. And why is that? You say, well, the UK has the National Health Service, right? Uh, so they track these costs more uh, more uh, uh, closely than our fragmented health system uh, in the United States. So looking at um, at, at the UK data. Um, uh, dementia uh, itself causes increased length of stay by 6 to 30 days. Uh, it's a risk factor for high length of stay. Um, they, patients with dementia have overall higher uh, length of stay. They have higher rates of readmission, higher mortality rates, and increased risk of discharge to an institution. So all of those uh, markers or those, uh, those metrics are poor health outcomes. Um, and then patients with dementia are also more twice as likely to be discharged specifically to nursing homes. So high costs, high lengths of stay, and they tend to be discharged to uh, long-term care facilities. How about when they end up in the hospital? Do we recognize them to have dementia? Not really. Only 50% of persons living with dementia are admitted to the hospital have prior diagnosis. And detection rates of dementia in the inpatient settings are also low. Uh, less than 50%, certainly. So again, the problem is that when they end up in the hospital, we don't recognize them. And so it prevents us from, from uh, instituting ways to improve their care uh, and improve uh, the transitions in care. When they do end up in the hospital, unfortunately, because of the nature of the disease, uh, they have high uh, rates of aggression, anxiety during the hospital admission, they require more nursing time than people without dementia. Uh, and because they are older, they have, um, they have poorer nutrition, they have lower functional abilities, they have greater risk for delirium and worse hospital outcomes. So again, uh, high resource use and poor outcomes. So we're not achieving that high value care that we so value. How about the experience of care? So with everything that we're spending and all the things that uh, we're doing for patients with dementia, you would expect that our caregivers would be happy with the care that they, they get for uh, their loved one with dementia. Unfortunately, that's not true. So again, this is UK data because we don't have too many uh, uh, American data on this. Um, uh, the UK Care Quality Commission report in 2014 reported that 50% of hospitals had variable or poor practice in assessing the needs of people with dementia and the staff have poor knowledge and understanding of dementia. Again, this is British data, but I would venture to, uh, to guess or to predict that the American data would be similar. Caregivers in general tend to be dissatisfied with the dementia care that they receive. Um, they feel that patients do not receive comprehensive needs assessment and the caregivers are not sufficiently involved at the time of admission or discharge planning. And therefore, it's not surprising with, that when uh, a survey of uh, 
caregivers uh, conducted, by, conducted by the Alzheimer's Society in 2016 showed that 60% of caregivers felt that the, their loved one did not receive, uh, uh, they were not treated with dignity or understanding in the hospital. Um, the NHS in the UK, as I mentioned, uh, follows data about dementia care in the hospital very closely. In fact, they do this every several years survey of dementia care, or they, and they call it dementia audit. Um, and they look at things like lens of stay, they look at quality of assessment of patient needs, and caregiver quality of care. And what they found was that um, the median lens of stay is quite long. Um, uh, you know, uh, 12 days uh, is the median, but it ranged from 5 to 39 days. And what they found was that there were certain patterns that lead to better or lower lens of state. Like, for example, discharge planning is done within the first 24 hours of admission. Like when uh, there's a review of delayed discharges to see what lessons can be learned. Interestingly, in the UK, minority populations, Black and Asian minority ethnic patients had shorter lengths of stay. And in their, in their series, uh, patients who were in the geriatric units had longer lengths of stay. I don't know why that is. Uh, maybe because certain things are uncovered more in the geriatric units than in the general medical floor. So um, there are certain things that we can learn from the, the UK in terms of how we can improve our American system of hospital care for, for people with dementia. Uh, Dementia-specific staff training is important and needs to be emphasized for better quality uh, dementia care. Um, having educators in hospital units to role model best practices is something that we could all think about integrating in our, our, in our hospital system. Uh, certainly staff training and changing the hospital culture to promote staff autonomy and de-emphasize de sort of those rigid task-oriented practice can make our staff more flexible so that they can be more responsive to the needs of their patients and therefore deliver more uh, patient-centered care. So um, there are seven key themes for quality of care. Looking at the care environment uh, are the hospitals that uh, where we provide care, the units that we provide care for patients with dementia. Are they busy or noisy or impersonal? Do they lack privacy? Are there things we can improve in terms of the care environment? How about the culture of care? Are the nurse managers, for example, do they underestimate the needs of persons with dementia? And do they provide adequate training for their staff or not? They give adequate time. How about attitudes? When a person with dementia is admitted to a nurse nursing unit, um, do they feel that this is uh, an overly burdensome uh, admission that will make their jobs more difficult? Or do they feel empowered to provide better care. Um, how about the challenges of dementia patients? If you have uh, a behavioral issues, do they provide uh, disruption? Do they, do they uh, disrupt the routine care, the routine uh, practices of that nursing unit? And do they feel that this is going to be burdensome? Challenges of dementia caregivers. Um, um, having a, a loved one admitted to a hospital provides more uh, challenges in terms of emotional exhaustion. And a lot of times when the patient's discharged from the hospital to home, they're not the same patients, right? They could have been delirious. They could have been uh, more impaired physically. Uh, challenges to staff, uh, overwhelmed by challenging behaviors. And finally, uh, service models. What are the staff uh, training that we provide uh, that improves their confidence? I'm not going to go over these in detail, but for those who are interested, you can look at these, uh, this uh, article from uh, Gordon Jones uh, in 2020, looking at um, uh, from the patient standpoint, what does hospitalization look like? Right before admission, they have a neurologic impairment, they have behavioral issues, they have functional impairments, they could have pain, fear, insecurity. They end up in the hospital, and their experience could be one where someone is disoriented, they could be fearful, they could be um, uh, having difficulty communicating. And what response uh, does our health system provide these patients? Do we provide patient-centered care that empowers them and comforts them? Um, uh, or do we uh, stick to our routine, rigid, task-focused uh, care, which deprioritizes patient-centered care 
and therefore increases fear and insecurity and leads to poor outcomes in the post-discharge environment. From the um, provider standpoint, what staff characteristics do we have in our health system? Do they feel prepared? Do they feel empowered? Uh, what are their own attitudes, biases about patients with dementia? Based on that, this will predict what their individual responses are when they find dementia under persons with dementia under their care. Um, uh, what emotions, what conflict of care is provided. And from, um, uh, from a system standpoint, how do we manage this uh, before the hospital, during the hospital, after the hospital stay? So all of these illustrations just tell us that we could all do a better job in managing uh, dementia in the hospital, in the community, in the post-acute care environment. So what is needed for patient-centered care in the, hospital, uh, in the hospital? What's needed is really culture change, right? Workforce need to be retrained. Dementia, I would argue, need to be part of the training of every staff uh, in the hospital of how these patients with dementia are unique in their needs and in their vulnerabilities, um, how it would affect staff uh, ratios, staffing ratios, because patients with dementia likely need more time. As we know, they need more nursing time. How can the physical environment be modified so that it's more dementia friendly? Uh, you know, some simple things like reducing noise, uh, providing nameplates so that the patients with dementia can, can, uh, can recognize who's caring for them, um, uh, providing space around their beds to, uh, to, give, uh, to allow more room for personal items that make it more home-like. Um, having uh, caregivers, how do we approach caregivers? How do we invite caregivers to provide personalized information for the person with dementia so that we are more aware of who they are as people and not just as patients, right? And how do we share knowledge and information uh, with peers across uh, the health system? Uh, so these are some of the, the things that we can do. Increasing dementia understanding, in, increasing the education and training, modeling patient-centered care, and, and providing an environment that's more dementia-friendly are all things we can do better at in, uh, in terms of de developing dementia-capable health systems. Some of the research gaps that uh, I would pose for the uh, academics out there uh, is looking at specifically Alzheimer's disease in the U.S., general and specialty populations, for example, the ortho units, what is the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, uh, what are their the distinct vulnerabilities, prevalence of subtypes of dementia in the hospital service. Uh, so as you know, dementia is not just Alzheimer's disease, there's also Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's dementia, uh, vascular dementia, and they have different vulnerabilities that make them end up in different, the different hospital units. Um, how does ADRD or Alzheimer's disease related dementia influence patient outcomes and complication like infection rates, like their ability to follow instructions post discharge, like um, um, uh, healthcare associated harms like falls, uh, the quality of hospital care for persons with dementia? Uh, do we achieve high quality care for persons with dementia or not compared to other peoples without dementia? Um, how, what is their overall satisfaction with hospital care in the United States? And then specifically patients who are part of ethnic, racial uh, minorities, do they get the same level of care than patients who are not part of racial and ethnic minorities when they end up with dementia, with hospital care, and they have the additional uh, um, vulnerability of having dementia? So um, at Cedar sinai where I currently work, uh, I, I work in the Golden Center for Alzheimer's Disease and Memory Disorders, where we not only uh, want to improve the care, but also find potential cures and, uh, you know, latest diagnostics and therapeutics for dementia. But we're also very much uh, interested in improving the care of patients with dementia in our healthcare system. In uh, the Sears Sinai Medical Center, Sears Sinai is a large um, hospital, um, uh, close to 900 beds in uh, Los Angeles, in a best busy urban area, um, compared to other academic medical centers. In fact, we have 
uh, the, a greater number of patients over the age of 85. Uh, so we have quite a bit of uh, older patients, and as a result, we have quite a bit of patients with dementia. In fact, about 14,000 uh, patients with dementia were admitted to our medical center in the last uh, four years or so. We also have uh, we also follow patients in the skilled nursing facilities. Uh, we also have uh, private practitioners who admit patients to our hospital. Uh, we call the Sierra Sinai Health Associates. We also have uh, the medical group, the Sierra Sinai Medical Group, uh, that manage patients. We also have affiliations to area hospitals. Um, uh, Marion Del Rey is one of our core hospitals. It's not an affiliate, but it's not one of our core hospitals. West of here, closer to the coast. But we also have affiliations with Torrance Memorial Hospital in South Bay. Uh, we're working on establishing affiliations with Huntington Memorial Hospital east of here in Pasadena. And we have an established um, affiliation with Providence Tarzana Medical Center in San Fernando Valley, uh, north of uh, the medical center. So the Sierra Sinai Health System is a large health system. And um, I'm sure like Penn and other places, we recognize that dementia is not just in the hospital. It's certainly not just in a memory center. It, uh, the memory center is meant to be uh, in, on the cutting edge of research and uh, clinical care for complex dementias. But a lot of patients with dementias are in our primary care practices. They're in our hospitals. They are in our community. So um, if you look at, again, the current state of hospital care of patients with dementia, patients with dementia come with their own set of vulnerabilities. Up to 95% of patients with dementia have multiple chronic conditions. So dementia with diabetes, dementia with hypertension, with stroke, with uh, congestive heart failure. 90% have behavioral symptoms. 70% of dementia patients have experienced falls. And as you said, patients with, with dementia are older and they tend to have worse hospital outcomes. So here they are. They have patient vulnerabilities and somehow they end up in our hospitals. What happens? They, have, uh, they tend to have had previous hospital admissions and ED admissions. They tend to have decreased uh, completion of advanced directive and, and position order for life-sustaining treatment. They have high psychoactive medication um, prescription. They have high restraints use. And um, as I mentioned, decreased dementia uh, listed in the admission diagnosis. So is it a surprise then that they have poorer outcomes? high discharge to institutional facilities, high readmission rates, and high lens of stay. So I think this is the current state for a lot of our hospital systems, including mine, including yours. And the question for us and the challenge is what can we do about it? So I think some of the things that we can think of is um, uh, recognizing what are the quality gaps. So at Sierra Sinai, uh, dementia care is one of our uh, quality care initiatives. Uh, and we're looking at um, how we can improve uh, the low rates of identification of so persons with dementia when they're admitted to our hospital, perhaps leveraging uh, uh, our, uh, our electronic medical record system using artificial intelligence in identifying these patients, um, identifying why there are uh, less than ideal rates of, uh, of addressing advanced directives, and how we can improve on that in aligning with our other initiative, which is a serious illness quality improvement initiative. We're looking at the, the management of uh, behavioral psychological symptoms of dementia. Uh, we'd like to re reduce the rate of uh, restraint use and psychoactive medication use. And we're looking at potentially uh, training a dementia specialist nurse uh, who can be embedded in the inpatient setting, who can improve the care of these patients with dementia and then uh, also improving the patient-centeredness of our patient care by uh, putting together disease care uh, management tools and uh, quality improvement initiatives to improve interdisciplinary collaboration. So, um, so um, one of the things that we're developing here that we're excited about is called the CEDAR-6. Um, it's a mnemonic that we obviously adapted to CEDAR so that it's more uh, uh, easy to remember for our, for our staff, but it's also uh, outside of CEDARS uh, when we roll it out, it'd be called AD-REX, which is the same, same uh, letters, just uh, done differently. So it's, what is it? It's a population-based approach to chronic disease management that allows us to stratify patients based on their risks, uh, characteristics, and resources, and optimize uh, outcomes, uh, improve quality and satisfaction, and reduce low-value care. 
So it's organized into six domains, which I'll show you in the next slide, that are independent but are interrelated. Um, and it allows us to focus our dementia evaluation on these six domains and make our care more patient-centered. So what does it look like? So again, CEDAR-6 we call it here, but it's AD Rex elsewhere. Uh, so it looks at six domains, cognition and behaviors, environment, diseases, medications, advanced directive goals of care, resources, and social determinants of health. Uh, this is, uh, CEDAR-6 is a framework uh, that we've been using in our outpatient um, uh, 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 dementia care. But uh, in the inpatient setting, there's something that we are planning to uh, roll out where in each of the members of the interdisciplinary team will be in charge of each domain, right? You can see, for example, the nurse is getting more information of what the patient is like cognitively, what behavioral problems uh, they have, what are the things we can improve on in terms of their uh, inpatient dementia care. Environment, where they came from, where are they going? Uh, are there, uh, is their home situation adequate? Is it safe? Uh, are there things that are missing? Diseases and medication, what life limiting conditions they have besides dementia? Do they have uh, end state CHF or CKD that needs to be taken into consideration because dementia makes management of chronic conditions more challenging? Uh, so the physician, for example, can, can uh, uh, do that uh, part. The other thing that the physician will be responsible for is making sure that there are the advanced directive and goals of care discussion relative or specific to dementia is done because a lot of times uh, dementia is not seen as uh, a life-limiting conditions when in fact we know from literature that um, the, um, the life expectancy for patients with dementia, especially those coming from nursing homes with advanced dementia is similar to someone with metastatic cancer, right? We don't dream or we don't discharge patients with metastatic cancer full code uh, without having a, a, a very solid discussion about goals of care. But Susan Mitchell's uh, uh, study in uh, end-stage dementia shows that their mortality is uh, as similar to end-stage uh, uh, cancer, metastatic cancer. So it's important to have that discussion. And then R stands for resources. So what do they have in terms of accessible people, finances, or physical resources? Uh, social workers can fill that out. And finally, social determinants of health. They have access to good medical care. They have access to um, to nutritious foods, uh, people who will support them if they need it. So our vision is that this can be integrated into our inpatient service so that each um, uh, professional team, member of the professional team, can fill out each of these and uh, be integrated into our EMR, which is EPIC-based. Uh, and we'd like this to be part of the discussion for every case management or discharge planning, is to look at the patient holistically not just the aspiration pneumonia that they came with, not just the UTI or sepsis, but look at the entirety of the patient. So we have a, um, a we're very proud of our stroke center here at Cedar sinai uh, uh, because our stroke uh, data, quality, metrics, outcomes, satisfaction is very high. But um, if we think about stroke as, um, as a model of a neurologic disease that can be managed uh, better, through a care continuum in the community. It's a recognition of stroke. Uh, as you know, public information on stroke is, is uh, very effective in knowing, uh, recognizing signs of a stroke. I think we should do a, a similar public education campaign that's equally effective in having people recognize how to, how to uh, 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 know if someone's having dementia and what can be done about it, right? And if they do end up in the emergency room in the hospital setting, how do we manage them? So just like in stroke, we need protocols for dementia in our geriatric emergency departments. We need protocols for dementia in our hospitals. Uh, we need to consider dementia in the discharge planning and in the community when they return, it doesn't uh, end there. It needs to reach out to the community to make sure that these are sustained. Uh, this is from Sue Borson again and Josh Chodosh looking at the interrelatedness or the interactions between CBOs or community-based organizations, uh, uh, the, the patient and caregiver dyad, uh, the primary care practices, the dementia specialists, which are the geriatricians, geriatric psychiatrists, neurologists, and neuropsychologists, and how the effective dementia care management can be uh, at the center of this, sort of the 
the hub uh, in the spokes of the wheel, right? That brings everything together. So I showed you this, which is the, uh, the typical slide that we show and whenever we, we want to uh, talk about disease modifying therapies and uh, early diagnosis and treatment for dementia. But I would argue that, um, that so I superimposed here some of the interventions that we should be doing at each stage of this illness. So at the preclinical stage, again, at the stage where we have elevated amyloid or, or tau, but no symptoms, it's really about risk reduction, isn't it? It's managing uh, the, uh, the things that we know can increase the risk for dementia to reduce the population burden. Uh, but even with the best uh, risk reduction or prevention uh, 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 intervention, there will still be a subset of patients who will succumb to dementia. That's for a fact. So for these patients, we would like to have early diagnosis and when available, disease-modifying therapies, right? So that to, re again, reduce the disease burden. And then for those patients who get dementias and advance to the late stages of dementia, we need to provide support and palliation. So that's sort of the continuum that I envision for uh, our management of dementia. And all throughout this, we need to be able to make sure, we, we need to make sure that our, our, um, our, our health system is dementia capable. Um, looking at the uh, longitudinal person-centered care plan, um, we need to make sure that the patient-centered care plan has a treatment plan, a clinical care plan, but also plan for long-term services and support plan in case they need it, right? And that planning has to start early. There also has to be an emergency care plan so that if they, they do end up with a crisis, our patients know where to go to, where to turn, and what kind of care is needed. And throughout the care continuum, whether home or community-based care, post-acute care, or acute care and emergency care, there has to be uh, 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 thought and consideration of how those uh, care can be delivered seamlessly and uh, of high quality, high value, and, uh, and high patient satisfaction. Um, so again, uh, at Cedar sinai we're trying to improve the health span of our patients with Alzheimer's disease. In the community, we'd like to increase the awareness of the public and empower them to seek uh, care if they feel that their or their loved one is experiencing signs of dementia. Uh, we are working with our primary care uh, practices for early identification of these patients. We are hoping to establish a registry of Alzheimer's disease patients in the Cedar sinai Health System so they can be identified and interventions can be done early. Um, we're aiming to improve population health uh, by uh, instituting uh, uh, risk reduction um, um, interventions and dementia care coordination in the community to reduce unnecessary uh, hospitalization and ER visits. In the emergency department, we're working with our emergency department here to improve uh, the way that patients, older patients in general, and patients with cognitive impairment in particular, can be managed uh, so that they are sort of not lost in the system and they can be uh, uh, given the high quality care at the outset. And so the patients who don't have, who do not need to be admitted, do not uh, end up in the hospital unnecessarily because we know that when they end up in the hospital, they are at greater risk for delirium and other, other outcomes. If they do need hospitalization and um, end up in our hospital, we are working with our quality care uh, initiative team to make sure that they get the best quality care, um, uh, including uh, partnering with our nursing staff, our, our case management, our physicians, our medical staff, uh, therapy, et cetera, to make sure that uh, the, the unique needs of our patients with dementia are recognized and our care paths are modified to better fit their needs. And finally, in the post-acute care, uh, making, sure, sure, making sure that they, when they do end up in the post-acute care, things like goals of care, things like uh, home safety, caregiver education, et cetera, are addressed. So that is our vision for the future and hopefully uh, we can achieve this so that uh, this will be a model for the future uh, dementia-capable health system. So the World Health Organization uh, provided the six stages of acceptance of dementia. Um, this six stages of acceptance for dementia is really something that we can apply for public policy, public health, 
but also for our health system. So our health system start with ignoring the problem, right? Oh, we don't have too much dementia here. They come with aspiration pneumonia, falls, etc. But dementia is not a big problem. And then when you show them data, you, you realize, huh, maybe dementia is a problem, isn't it? Uh, because again, the ignoring the problem is easy because less than half are, of our patients with dementia who are admitted to the hospital are recognized to have dementia, right? But when you see the, the, the data, it's, uh, there's increased awareness. Um, if there is, God forbid, a, a bad outcome with someone with dementia, media get involved, then, then that becomes an issue. Uh, and then, you know, things um, are then started to make sure that these patients who are vulnerable are then cared for. Uh, then, then comes building the dementia infrastructure, uh, reaching out to community-based organizations like Alzheimer's associations, attending professional meetings, caregiver training is instituted, advocacy efforts comes after uh, uh, publication of uh, certain quality data, uh, providing patient uh, uh, professional guidelines for improving dementia care, and then downstream, improving standards of care, instituting policies that will improve care for patients with dementia. Uh, gaining a broader public health perspective of how we can best best care for these patients, and finally normalization and acceptance of dementia as part and parcel of uh, what we need to consider in delivering delivering high quality care within our health systems.